Uh, I'm Nadia Peek. I'm a PhD student at the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, this is a picture of my messy desk, a blurry picture of my messy desk with a bunch of um, machines on it that I've built um, in the basement with a bunch of other machines that I haven't built and have been interfacing with. And this talk is going to be about um, kind of small scale automation and making digital fabrication equipment. Um, so here's a, here's a photograph I took last semester. Um, it's a seven axis robot arm um, that was parked out in the garden by N52. Um, and there are some students that are cutting a complex surface on the uh, styrofoam that you see on the right. Um, so they have grasshopper scripted to kind of follow the contours. The inverse kinematics of the robot arm are all figured out. And they're, uh, and they're cutting out this shape that is you know, relatively hard for uh, someone to um, be able to make with human dexterity. Um, and so there's a lot of complicated technology that is involved in this process, except if you look on the left, there's a person holding a surge protector. Um, so why, why, how is that part of the system? Um, so the hot end that's cutting the styrofoam has to be a certain temperature so it doesn't, it doesn't melt away all of the styrofoam. And so he's standing there with his thumb on the switch, flipping it off and on to control the temperature. Um, so it's a, it's a a very expensive resource, a human brain, to control the temperature of something that's actually kind of stupid. Um, and it's just the easiest way for them to get the job done, you know, to interface with the system. They thought, you know, we, we, could, we could do something complicated where we, where we tried to change Google robot language and, uh, and, and add it in, but they didn't, uh, they didn't really feel like they had time or, or, or felt like doing that. So, um, you know, if we look through how we program digital fabrication equipment right now, maybe you start with a solid model in CATIA or SOLIDWORKS. Um, you make a toolpath in HSMWorks, MasterCam, all of those expensive, complicated software packages. And then you make it into G code. Um, you use a post processor that's maybe specific for your machine. And then you use a programming language that was developed in the 50s and doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of capability in it to express complex functions. Um, and then you go for a super high-tech interface of a USB stick in your pocket, bring it to your machine for runtime, which has this awesome user interface. Then you reach into your other pocket to install the tool that you have. And then you just kind of watch the machine have all the fun. It's uh, too bad. Um, and while standing there, there's not necessarily a whole lot you can do to change how the machine is running. All the state is in the machine. There's a G-code interpreter that kind of is just processing things through. If you, if you mess up and you have to go back, you don't necessarily know exactly where everything is. And so the way that I think of digital fabrication equipment is kind of in the, in the realm of this pyramid. So um, the reason that I made it pyramid-shaped is because I think the most common things that people develop are kind of at the bottom going up. So applications and interfaces, I mentioned it briefly already. Uh, you have uh, CAD software packages. You have um, CAM software packages, um, interfaces to control the machines. Those are all relatively easy to prototype, because making software is a pretty quick turnaround process. Um, and then for the control system layer, you, you could have some kind of, some kind of uh, motor controller, um, something that's doing real-time control and synchronization. Uh, Fanuc motor controller is pretty common. Um, and then you're interfacing with kind of sensor and actuator layer in your machine. So you have motors that have to move. Uh, you, have, uh, you have maybe some kind of feedback that you want to be measuring. Maybe you're measuring temperature and using that in the motion of your machine. Um, and the mechanical system that you're using is maybe also abstracted from uh, the tool head that you're, that you're interfacing with. So like people put all kinds of things onto seven axis robot arms. Uh, people put all kinds of things onto uh, three axis stages. Um, and so that mechanical system can be relatively deviant. And then your end effector, the thing that you're actually using to affect the material that you're dealing with, that could be a spindle or maybe a 3D print head or maybe a pipetter for a liquid handler in a bio lab. Um, and so each of these layers in this pyramid are all relatively well-established fields. They're not, it's not like anyone hasn't been working on this for you know, less than 20 years. However, every single time you seem to have to get one of the things to talk to the other things, it's kind of like a bad party game of telephone. You're, you're there, you just kind of like try to talk from one thing to the next thing, and it's a, and it's a frustrating process often. And, you know, uh, 
people like me who are extremely stubborn end up being very good at it because you, you just kind of hit the machine until it does what you want. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, like, it's not super fun. Um, so at the Center for Bits and Atoms, uh, we have a lot of different kinds of, of fabrication equipment. And at some point, we started um, kind of trying to democratize them in places called fab labs. So this is a fab lab um, in Vestmanair, Iceland. So you can think of it kind of like a library, except instead of people coming to use books, um, people come to use digital fabrication equipment. Um, and so here we have a three-axis large format milling machine. So say you wanted to make furniture, um, a small format milling machine. So say you wanted to prototype electronics. Um, full electronics workbench for populating circuit boards that you might have made previously on the small format three-axis milling machine. Um, 3D printers, 3D scanners, all stuff that's relatively um, yeah, accessible now. You, I don't know if any of you guys went to Maker Faire last weekend, but there are hundreds of... Yeah, ooh, Maker Faire. <laughs> There, there are hundreds of machines that are like relatively inexpensive that you can buy and put in your lab, but they're all kind of small, cheaper versions of the machines that you see in an industrial setting. And the interfaces to them are sometimes just kind of stupider or like still unusable um, unless you're very tenacious. Uh, uh, system. So, you know, in terms of making new machines or making different kinds of machines, what are um, what are things that um, you can that we can that we can kind of think of? Um, so, this is a CNC multi-purpose CNC machine that I made with my friend Alan Moyer. Um, it, current in this photograph, it has a milling head on it, so I'm using it to prototype a circuit board. The pleasant outside sunshine that's frequently in Boston, um, and uh, uh, and you need a certain kind of hardware module to be able to control the spindle. Um, and it's also a whoops, 3D printer. Um, and so the different modules that we're using in this machine have to be controlled um, with different kinds of electronics and different kinds of software. And so it starts you thinking about um, the modularity of the system um, that you're kind of interfacing with. Uh, So it's, it, it's, not a, it's not a more complicated machine than any other 3D printer, except it's uh, kind of cool that it fits in a briefcase. And the TSA has actually never asked me to open it or asked any questions about it, which <laughs> I kind of think uh, is a little bit strange. But um, And so yeah, kind of thinking about the modularity in the control system made us also think about the modularity um, in the mechanics of the system. So here, you know, the z-axis and the xy-axis here are kind of two separately prototyped things that we built. Um, and so we were thinking about, can we abstract that even more? So together with uh, James Coleman, who's here somewhere, um, I've been working on abstracting motion in systems to, to kind of like single units of fab. So say you want to move something back and forth and you want to move something rotary. Instead of necessarily buying an expensive seven axis robot arm, can you also make a lot of different small modular components that you can use to prototype any kind of machine automation that you might need? Um, and so we have a, a 3D printer prototype, we have like a plotting prototype, we have a four axis hot wire cutter prototype. You know, you want to do a 3D printer that is on a rotary stage instead of on a linear stage. Um, you can kind of all just bolt them together in, in these different patterns um, and use them for whatever it is that your, your application might be. Um, and you don't necessarily only have to use these kinds of motion systems, you can add any other motion system and have them speak on the same bus um, that. Uh, that, you used to, that we're using a prototype. And so, you know, we've been thinking for a long time at the Center for Bits and Atoms about what are better ways to control machines that don't necessarily have all of this state in the machine. So if you can talk directly from your CAD software to, uh, if you can talk directly from your CAD software to your motor system, you can define moves that are kind of more relevant to the design that you're, uh, that you're making. So instead of taking a design and then turning it into lots of triangles that interpolate a curve and then turning that curve into smaller move sections that the, that the robot is supposed to take on, maybe you can just tell it, hey, this is a, this is a complex arc, and you can figure out how to do it. Um, and, the, and, and the machine can figure out how to do that in the most uh, efficient way. So 
Um, the motor control network that I've been working on, again with Alarm, um, allows you to just add more modules as you add more axes. So say you have a four-axis machine that you're prototyping and you want to add a fifth axis, you don't have to re-prototype all of your hardware. You just plug in an extra module to the network. Um, so modularity makes things easier, right? That's what John was saying. Um, and not to bore you terribly with the code, but just to explain how uh, you would might, um, how you might prototype the machine, you, you simply specify what each node is in Python instead of having to write embedded C to do, uh, to do um, motion interpretation. Um, so here's, a, here's basically how we, a, a setup of, of, a, of a machine that James and I um, put in the lobby of the Media Lab to do a four axis hot wire cutting. Um, and we built the whole machine, including the individual stage components, um, in I think like 20 hours. Because at MIT they don't encourage you to sleep, <laughs> and uh, and and yeah, just kind of prototyping and putting it together was all relatively straightforward. So we were able to cut um, airfoils pretty quickly. And since then we've also reused the modules to make little drawing robots and 3D printing robots. Uh, so airfoils. This is a Mark Drella original for those of you who are familiar with airfoil geometries. And so, I don't know, this is uh, all of the machines that we work on at MIT and the um, machines that make project groups, sort of, they're all open source. So it's, uh, if, you go to, uh, if you go to our website, you can download any of the different individual components and see what kind of machines we've been building with it. So besides the hot wire cutter and the suitcase fab, I've also built liquid handlers for less than $800 in parts. Um, different kinds of software interfaces, so controlling, controlling CAD systems from the browser instead of having to install complicated apps um, to do it uh, on your computer. Um, also, a, a gigapan microscopy um, if you wanted to do imaging. So you can imagine that as, for example, biology labs want to do more experiment automation, you could have uh, a machine that you just prototype on the fly to say, OK, here's a fish that I want to shine this wavelength laser at at this point. And then if it turns this color, I want to do this. Or if it turns another color, I want to do something else. Um, and so these kind of systems make it a lot easier. So rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping machines. If you want to build something for um, automation that's application specific, um, I think that this is kind of the approach that would encourage you to take. Um, I'm going to have office hours, so you can ask me about linear algebra, I guess, at 10.30. Um, and tomorrow, uh, we're going to be, James and I will be demoing uh, some of the machines so you can reconfigure them and the Solid Fellows demo pavilion. Um, so that's all. Thanks.